in the last lecture uh, we discussed how response spectrum method of analysis uh, is developed and uh, then we discussed the uh, accuracy of the response spectrum method in the sense that there is an approximation involved in the combination of the maximum modal responses and because of this approximation it is uh, called an approximate method of analysis. However, it was found that uh, for most of the cases it uh, fairly predicts the mean peak value of the response. We developed uh, the response spectrum method of analysis for single support excitation uh, that is uh, the I is a vector of 111 or 101010 uh, whatever be the case. And then briefly we mentioned that the, the three different rules of the combination of the maximum responses or peak responses, uh, they are how they are uh, approximate and how these CQC rule and SRSS rule have been developed. Uh, let me uh, recapitulate it again. Uh, that is, we assume that the modal responses, that is, the response in each mode of vibration, is a quantity which is random and uh, it is uncorrelated to the other mode of response or in other words there is no correlation that exists between the uh, two uh, modal responses and with the with this assumption the SRSS rule is developed. However, if we consider that the there exist a relationship uh, between the first mode response and the second mode of response and so on. Uh, then we say that uh, they are correlated and we must have a correlation function uh, defined between these uh, any two uh, modal responses and improve the SRSS rule uh, by converting into a CQC rule which is called the complete quadratic combination rule in which we bring in the rho i j that is the correlation between two modal responses. And in that connection uh, we say that uh, the derivation of CQC rule uh, and SRSS rule uh, they are best obtained uh, with the help of the random vibration analysis technique. Uh, assuming that the uh, responses in each mode of vibration that is the Z1, Z2, Z3, they are the random variables and there should exist a correlation between these random variables and that is how CQC rule was developed and CQC rule since it uh, considers this uh, correlation between Z1, Z2, etc. they are, are more exact compared to SRSS. Then we also mentioned that since the power spectral density function of ground motion and the response spectrum of ground motion both of them indicate the frequency composition of the ground motion as such or the frequency composition of the future ground motion that is going uh, that is expected. Therefore, there should exist a relationship between the two and that relationship 
uh, was obtained by Kudigian uh, using the equations uh, in which the power spectral density function of ground acceleration was related to the displacement response spectrum and P0 omega which uh, the peak factor which varies with omega uh, that is involved and this peak factor we have discussed uh, before uh, when we are discussing about the uh, response of the structures to random ground motion in the PVR in the previous sets of lecture. Now, if the ground motion is assumed as a stationary random process then generalized coordinate uh, in each mode is also a random process and there should exist a cross correlation between the generalized coordinates as I uh, mentioned before. So, uh, with this uh, background in view the response spectrum method of analysis can be extended for multi support excitation and uh, today we are going to discuss about that. Because uh, there exist uh, a cross correlation between two modal peak responses and uh, we if we consider uh, these rho i j uh, then the sequence rule provides a better estimate than the SRSS rule that of combination that uh, we uh, uh, mentioned also. So, let us see what basically uh, rho i j uh, looks uh, like that is the correlation between the two modal responses rho i j uh, that is uh, plotted with respect to omega i by omega j that is the frequency between the uh, two modes. And if we look at that plot then this plot looks like this and the corresponding equation equation 5.14 and 5.15 that we discussed uh, in the last uh, lecture the these two equations that is rho i j is a function of beta i j where beta i j is the ratio between omega i and omega j and xi is the specified damping ratio. So, two such uh, empirical equations for rho i j were developed one by Rosenbluth and other by der Kudigian and uh, if we uh, plot them against beta i j that is the frequency ratio then the plot looks like this. And one can see that on the right hand side and the left hand side is a symmetric half of the right hand side. So, if we look at the right hand side that is the positive frequency ratios we can see that as the frequency ratio increases that is uh, omega y by omega j that increases. Uh, then the rho y j basically uh, sharply falls down and beyond a certain value of the ratio the correlation coefficient is almost equal to 0. So, that justifies the use of SRSS rule that is uh, SRSS rule is applicable when the two frequencies are well separated and once the two frequencies are well separated then the frequency ratio is also high and as a result of that the correlation between two modal responses can be ignored and they can be considered as independent random variables. So, uh, using uh, this figure and the two uh, equations uh, that is the uh, empirical equation on uh, rho i j that was developed. Uh, we take care of the correlation between the 
two modal responses and uh, using CQC rule uh, one can obtain and the um, combination between the uh, two more responses. Now let us uh, look at uh, uh, some example and in this example uh, the what has been done is that the power spectral density function have been obtained from the uh, smooth displacement RSP and FFT of L centro record that is the L we have used the L centro record and from the L centro record we obtained a response spectrum and smoothened it. Then also for the same time history uh, we obtained the power spectral density function using FFT and it was smoothened and then these two were compared in this figure. You can see the unsmooth uh, comparison that means unsmooth uh, power spectral density function obtained by these two approaches are compared in the first figure and then when they are smooth with 5 point uh, smoothing uh, then you can see that uh, the uh, both PSDFs compare quite well. Uh, that is the equation that is used for obtaining the power spectral density function of ground acceleration from the displacement response spectrum for a given uh, damping uh, that is uh, uh, quite valid. So, uh, and that is seen from uh, this example. Now, let us come to the application of the response spectrum method of analysis uh, for 2D frames. 2D frame means uh, it is a uh, building frame, multi bay, uh, multi story building frame. And for that uh, we proceed in this particular fashion. Uh, the first the dynamic degrees of freedom uh, are considered and generally the dynamic degrees of freedom for 2D frames uh, they are considered as the sway degrees of freedom. These sway degrees of freedom are obtained by the condensation procedure and this condensation procedure is uh, obtained slightly in a different way than the condensation procedure that uh, we have discussed before. Here what we do is that we write down the entire stiffness matrix uh, of the frame with uh, the rotations included and then apply unit load in the sway direction one by one that is uh, first we provide a unit load at the top of the frame and put 0 corresponding to other sway degrees of freedom and perform an analysis of the structure and for that we find out the sway responses at all degrees of freedom and put them into a vertical column. Similarly, any other response quantity of interest uh, that can be also obtained for this case and can be stored in the computer uh, in a matrix or a vector R uh, as the case may be if we consider more than uh, 2, 3 um, uh, responses then it, uh, it can be stored in the form of a matrix. If we are interested only say bending moment at a particular cross section then this will be a, a vector. So, uh, and that vector or matrix is called R. And this uh, R matrix or the vector R and the uh, matrix of the structure uh, or dis, uh, displacements that is uh, the uh, that, that what we obtain that is uh, um, called the flexibility matrix of the structure. So, corresponding to the sway degrees of freedom. So, this flexibility matrix of the structure can be inverted 
to obtain the uh, condensed stiffness matrix for the sway degrees of freedom of the frame. Sometimes there are algorithms which require only the mass matrix and the flexibility matrix of the structure rather than the stiffness matrix with the help of that also the Eigen values uh, can be obtained. So, uh, either we invert the flexibility matrix or uh, we directly use the flexibility matrix to obtain the mode shapes and frequencies of the structure. And by the time we do that, we have also uh, in an array are the response quantities of interest uh, that are stored for unit forces applied at uh, different sway degrees of freedom. Now, for each mode of uh, vibration one can calculate lambda i using the equation that we described before and these uh, instead of the mass m into i. Uh, we replace it by a summation convention uh, that is w r into phi i r uh, and sum it up for all the floors and w is the weight of the floor rather than the mass and since the mass appears both in the numerator and the denominator therefore, uh, it does not matter whether we consider mass or the weight. So, the standard expression that is used uh, in most of the uh, practices uh, in finding out lambda i, they use this particular formula. Once we you know, obtain the um, lambda i, then we obtain the uh, P i that is the equivalent lateral load that exists on the structure for each mode of vibration uh, from j is equal to 1 to r, r is the number of modes that we are considering and p j how it is calculated that you have discussed before for single point excitation. And any uh, response quantity of interest uh, say r j say bending moment, shear force, drift or any other response quantity interest that can be obtained by multiplying the equivalent lateral load with the uh, coefficient matrix for the response that is obtained uh, before and stored when you are obtaining the flexibility matrix of the structure by applying unit load at different sway degrees of freedom. After that, one can combine the uh, modal peak responses uh, either using CQC or SSS rule and that provides us a mean peak response uh, uh, that is desired. So, a problem is, is now solved in order to obtain the mean peak values of top displacement, base shear and interstory drift between first and second floor for a four story 2D frame uh, which was solved before uh, for the ground motion which is deterministic that is the for the same uh, L centro ground motion the or time history of ground motion was applied to this particular frame four story frame. And uh, the results the peak values of the results are known to us and the same uh, frame is now uh, analyzed using the response spectrum method of analysis. Here the response spectrum which is used is the response spectrum of the L centro earthquake. And the digitized values of these response spectrum uh, are available in many books including the books uh, including the book uh, which is the reference book for these slides. The frequencies omega 1, omega 2 and omega 3, the three frequencies of that structure uh, is, are given over here and then the uh, corresponding uh, mode shapes are shown 
uh, we have uh, given all the four modes. Then uh, we uh, compare the responses or the, rather the mean peak values of the responses obtained by different methods uh, in table uh, 5.1. And you can see that when we consider two modes only, then SRSS rule give uh, 0 0.9171 as the uh, response, then the sequency rule that gives 0 0.9121 quite close. The epsom gives a 0 0.9621 which is expected to be greater than the CQC or SRSS rule. And the time history response um, uh, that provides 0 0.8921 uh, that we obtained in the uh, in chapter 3 when we are discussing the response of uh, the same frame for L centro ground motion using uh, time integration technique. And one can see that the time history uh, response analysis and the uh, response spectrum method of analysis, they give quite uh, close results. When we consider uh, all modes, uh, then we can see that there is not much change in the response and that is all the four modes are considered and the results uh, between the time history of analysis and the response spectrum method of analysis using CQC and SRSS, SRSS rule, uh, they uh, compare very well. So far as base shear is concerned, uh, it is expressed in terms of mass. Uh, the when we consider the two modes only, then you can see the comparison. The time history uh, results give 980 as the maximum base shear, whereas the CQC gives 991 and the SRSS uh, give uh, higher value 1006. So, CQC rule and the time history rule are quite close to each other. And when you consider all modes, then the results uh, um, compare uh, very well between CQC and time history analysis. Similarly, when you look at the drift between the first floor and the second floor, uh, we see that the CQC rule and the time history analysis, they are quite close to each other. Uh, thus, we can see that in the response spectrum method of analysis, uh, if one uses CQC rule for cases where uh, the frequencies are not too well separated, uh, then uh, the results compare quite well with those obtained from the time history analysis. Now, let us look at the uh, application of the same response spectrum method of analysis for three dimensional tall frames. In fact, in the code of practice, the uh, response spectrum method of analysis and their formulas are to be used, uh, they are given specifically for 2D frames. For 3D tall frames, the code does not provide uh, the kind of guidelines uh, that we will be following over here. Uh, that is the code does not uh, provide uh, the responses. Uh, uh, using the response spectrum method of analysis, uh, the way it should be performed, it uh, considers the torsional effect of the 3D tall building slightly in a different way. However, here we will be following uh, the response spectrum method of analysis for 3D tall frames, which is just an extension of uh, uh, that what is done for 2D tall frames. 
Now the for the 3D tall frames we find out the principal direction of the 3D tall frame and for each principal direction we can apply the uh, ground motion separately and find out the response. And following uh, uh, steps are adopted, uh, firstly what we assume that the floors are rigid uh, a, like a rigid diaphragms and for each floor we find out the center of mass. Uh, then dynamic degrees of freedom at each floor that is two translation and a rotation about a vertical axis uh, which is uh, considered. And these dynamic uh, degrees of freedom are shown in this figure. Uh, left hand side figure is a symmetric uh, uh, building in which uh, the center of mass for all the floats are lying on the same vertical line. In the second figure we have offsets and the center of mass for each floor they uh, are not coinciding in the sense that they do not fall in the same vertical line. And therefore, we construct a CG of the mass line and uh, the intersection of the CG of the mass line with the floats uh, that is where the degrees of freedom are uh, considered and uh, 2 or 3 degrees of freedom are considered at each floor at that intersection point to translation and a rotation about a vertical axis. Now once we have done that then uh, we apply unit load to each dynamic degrees of freedom one at a time and carry out the same kind of static analysis that you had performed for the 2D frame to find out the condensed stiffness matrix and then array of R or a R matrix of the responses of desired quantities. And then we go ahead uh, in the same fashion uh, as uh, we have done for the case of 2D frame. We have uh, now different mode shapes and frequencies and for each mode uh, we will get a uh, mass uh, mode participation factor. And once we use the uh, mode participation factor for each mode, uh, then uh, one can obtain the uh, general uh, single degree freedom equation uh, written in terms of the generalized coordinates. And uh, because of the coupling of the mode shapes, that is in certain cases uh, we have a translation in two directions as well as a torsion. So, that kind of mode shapes are known as the coupled mode shapes. So, for the coupled mode shapes we have a torsional uh, moment created at the intersection point of the vertical line or the mass vertical line with the floor and apart from the two forces that can act in the two translation direction. So, for asymmetric building even if we are applying a single component earthquake in a particular direction which may consider uh, coincide with x direction or y direction, uh, we can expect that there uh, uh, could be a uh, force in the x direction force in the y direction and a torsion about a vertical axis um, for a particular mode where which is a coupled mode. So, uh, the equivalent static uh, load that is P e i that you had uh, seen before for the 2D frame in that P e i now we expect that there could be the torsional moments apart from the tra translational force 
in x and y direction uh, for a 3D frame. And uh, thus uh, for an asymmetric building, uh, we expect both a torsional motion about the vertical axis and two translational displacement in x and y directions. An example of this type uh, is uh, solved for this particular problem uh, in which uh, we uh, uh, have taken a two story frame and in this two story frame the degrees of freedom um, are considered as this, this uh, 1, 2, 3 and 4, 5, 6 these are degrees of freedom and corresponding to these uh, 6 degrees of freedom we obtain the mode shapes and frequencies of the structure that is we had 6 mode shapes and 6 frequencies and uh, the uh, response quantities uh, that we require that is the torque at the first floor level and Vx and Vy at the base of column A. Uh, that is to be found out. So, for these response uh, quantities, we obtain a an array of matrix R that is the R matrix um, that we talked about uh, when we were obtaining the flexibility matrix for this structure by applying unit load uh, uh, one at a time at each degree of freedom. The results of the analysis are shown in this table uh, that is uh, when we consider the uh, SRSS rule, CQC rule and time history analysis for the uh, same frame, we find out that the displacement um, uh, that is uh, uh, there for direction 1 and 2, these displacements are 0 0.1431 and 0 0.1325. Uh, they are obtained by SRSS rule and CQC rule respectively and the time history analysis provide uh, a response, maximum value of the response as 0 0.1216. In the for the second degree of freedom, that is uh, this in this degree of freedom uh, the uh, earthquake excitation uh, is acting uh, for uh, in this uh, degree of, along the direction of this degree of freedom whereas uh, the second direction is perpendicular to that and one can see that uh, the displacements in that directions are quite small compared to the directions in which uh, the excitation or the ground motion is applied and uh, the value of the displacement or maximum value of the displacement obtained from the time history analysis is 0 0.0023 whereas we obtained from using CQC rule as 0 0.0031. The torque that is obtained uh, using CQC rule and the time history analysis about the vertical axis and uh, they compare quite well. So far as the shear uh, forces are concerned in the x and y direction, uh, we can see that the CQC rule and time history analysis uh, they give uh, fairly or they compare fairly well. Next uh, let us uh, now try to develop or extend the method of response spectrum analysis to uh, multi support excitation case. And as I uh, told you before that the response spectrum method of analysis is not strictly valid for uh, the uh, multi support excitation system it is strictly valid for single point excitation for which it was derived. However, uh, if we wish to extend it 
for the multi support excitation case, then some additional assumptions are made. Then the derivation of the uh, response spectrum method of analysis for multi support excitation uh, requires a random vibration analysis uh, that is a, a part of it uh, uses the random vibration analysis uh, to arrive at the required uh, equations that can be used for finding out the mean peak response uh, in the spirit of response spectrum method of analysis. And, uh, since it uh, requires uh, some random vibration analysis, uh, therefore, uh, the entire derivation is not described here. However, some features of that derivations are mentioned in order that uh, the extension of the method for multi support excitation can be understood. In the first place, uh, it is assumed that the future earthquake is represented by an averaged smooth response spectrum and a power spectral density function. Both of them are obtained from an ensemble of time histories. So, uh, we assume that there exists an ensemble of time histories or the past uh, time histories of earthquake. And using that ensemble of time histories, uh, we have established first that the that is a stationary random process, and then we obtain a power spectral density function for that ensemble of time histories. That is, uh, we have obtained the unique mean square value for that ensemble, and the distribution of that mean square value. Uh, gives us the power spectral density function what we described before. Many a time one can uh, use the assumption of ergodicity in order to obtain the power spectral density function easily with the help of a single time history using Fourier uh, trans, uh, transformation method. The response spectrum of uh, the earthquake can be obtained uh, from the single uh, time history record uh, the way it is uh, uh, done and we have described that uh, uh, the procedure we have described uh, when we are discussing about the seismic input to the structure. And both the response spectrum and PS power spectral density function thus obtained are smoothened. Then the most important point uh, that uh, comes in the extension of the response spectrum method of analysis from single point excitation to the multi point excitation is uh, the consideration of the lack of correlation that exists between ground motions at two points. And that we have seen that uh, can be obtained either by knowing the time lag between the two supports or by using a coherence function. And for the case of random uh, vibration analysis, we have seen that we have a number of uh, empirical equations which are available to represent the coherence function uh, to represent the lack of correlation between the ground motions at any two points. And we can use any one of those coherence function or the coherence function that is appropriate for that particular site or the area. Uh, next assumption that we uh, make is the about the peak factor. We have seen that the uh, peak response can be obtained by multiplying uh, a peak factor with the uh, a standard deviation of response or RMS value of the response for the zero mean process. And that peak factor can be obtained with the help of the first three uh, moments of the power spectral density function. And we also had shown an equation 
which provides a value of the peak factor uh, provided we know the duration and the moments of the power spectral density function. Using uh, that uh, equation one can find out the peak factor. Now, uh, here we make an assumption that the peak factor in each mode of vibration and the peak factor for the total response that is when we combine all the modes of vibration and obtain the total response uh, then the peak factors uh, they are assumed to be the same. In fact, uh, these peak factors in each mode of vibration may vary and the peak factor for the total response could be different than the peak factors that we obtain for each mode of vibration. However, for the development of the method a crucial assumption is made that these peak factors are all same. Uh, then in relationship uh, like equation 5.16 is established between the power spectral density function of the ground motion and the displacement response spectrum. And uh, uh, one such equation on empirical equation was uh, shown before uh, in equation 5.16. Then the mean peak value of any response quantity of interest R that is uh, consisting of two parts. The first part is called a pseudo-static response due to displacement of the responses and the second part is the dynamic response of the structure with respect to supports. Now, that uh, uh, they have been uh, discussed uh, before. If you are wanting to find out the absolute displacements at the different non-support degrees of freedom, then we have to add two responses one response or one displacement will be the dynamic displacement of those non-support degrees of freedom with respect to the base and then to that we will add the displacement that is caused due to the ground displacement at different supports and that would create a differential displacements between different supports resulting in some displacements at different sway degrees of freedom. So, these are called the pseudo static response and this pseudo static response is added to the dynamic response in order to get the total absolute value of the response. Uh, uh, either for displacement or for any other response quantity of interest. So, uh, in the usual uh, derivation of the response spectrum method of analysis, the second part is taken into consideration uh, that is a dynamic response of the structure with respect to support that is considered. Uh, uh, because for single support excitation uh, the response of the structure at non support degrees of freedom they uh, basically uh, are the dynamic response plus the uniform ground displacement that takes place at different non support degrees of freedom because of single point excitation they are added together and we can get the absolute value of the displacements at different degrees of freedom. However, uh, these absolute values of the displacement at different degrees of freedom do not carry much meaning because if you are wanting to find out the bending moment uh, or shear force at any particular cross section then the moment we try to find out the relative displacement between the two ends of the member then the effect 
of the ground displacement at different supports uh, they cancel because they are the same at different degrees of freedom because of the single component excitation. So, the uh, second part of the response is good enough for single point excitation. However, when we consider the multi support excitation, then we have to take into account this part also. And because of the presence of this part, uh, we require some kind of additional uh, information or additional assumption and also we have to go into uh, a random vibration analysis in order to take into account its effect uh, into the response spectrum method of analysis. So, uh, first what we do is that uh, we find out using the normal mode theory uncoupled dynamic equation of motion for each degree of freedom and here instead of a single mode participation factor lambda i, we have now beta k i represents the mode participation factor and uh, this beta k i this mode participation factor uh, for a particular mode uh, has different components that is uh, for different supports we have one mode participation factor in a particular mode and that beta k i is uh, given by this equation and uh, or you know how it has been derived. Next we uh, consider a single degree freedom oscillator subjected to a, a ground acceleration uh, u double dot uh, k that is the this is the u double dot k that is the ground uh, excitation at the kth support. Uh, if we consider that uh, then the response for the single degree of freedom oscillator to that ground uh, or that uh, that support excitation is say z bar k i. Then the total generalized displacement in the ith mode can be written by this summation uh, that is beta k i multiplied by z bar k i and summation is taken over all the supports. Now, once we are able to obtain the value of z i then the total response which we will be obtaining will be equal to two components of the response that we discussed before. This is the pseudo static part and this is the dynamic part which is coming from the dynamic analysis or modal dynamic analysis that we have performed over here. Now, phi bar i is the mode shape coefficient uh, for the response quantity of interest. It could be displacement, it could be bending moment, it could be shear force, but uh, this phi bar i has been obtained before and how we obtain the mode shape coefficient for different response quantities of interest that we have described before uh, while. Uh, uh, discussing the modal analysis technique. This a k is the coefficient matrix that is uh, if I give a unit displacement at the kth support then and keeping all other supports locked or fixed then what is the displacement that is uh, obtained at different non support degrees of freedom and that can be arranged in the form of a matrix and the elements of the matrix can be uh, taken and those using those elements of the matrix one can find out a response quantity 
uh, over uh, all the pseudo-static response quantity uh, over here using this summation. Now, this a k could be a coefficient for displacement, could be a coefficient for bending moment, could be a coefficient for shear force, whatever be the response quantity of interest. So, this is the pseudo static part and this is the dynamic part. Uh, then what we do is that we uh, substitute in place of j di uh, this equation as a result of this, uh, this r t any response quantity of interest can be written in this particular form. Now, these uh, equation can be written in the matrix form in which a t is the transpose of the matrix, the coefficient matrix for pseudo static response, u t is the vector of the ground displacement at different supports and phi beta t is a transpose of a matrix called phi beta, we will shortly explain it what it is and z bar t is the response of the generalized or the generalized uh, displacement uh, that we obtain for each mode of vibration. The phi beta and z bar are vectors of size m into s that is uh, m is the number of modes that we are considering and s is the number of supports. Uh, for three support and two mode one further uh, elaborate this phi beta vector and the z bar vector. So, you can see that phi beta t is equal to phi bar 1 beta 1 1, phi bar 1 beta 2 1, phi bar 1 beta 3 1, then phi bar 2 starts, phi bar 2 beta 1 2, phi bar 2 beta 2 2, phi bar 2 beta 3 2 and so on. If you have got uh, some other or mode, then it starts with phi bar 3 beta 1 3 like that. The z bar t is z bar 1 1, z bar 2 1, z bar 3 1. Uh, since we are considering here uh, the number of uh, supports as 3, then uh, other modes as 3, uh, then z bar 1 1, z bar 2 1 and z bar 3 1, z bar 1 2, z bar 2 2 and z bar 3 2. Uh, so, these are uh, the z uh, uh, bar values. Now, we assume that R t, U t and z bar t to be random processes. Since the excitation uh, is random, and represented by an ensemble of record. Uh, therefore, uh, R t the response, the U t the, uh, the displacements at different uh, supports and z bar t the generalized responses, they are all random uh, processes. Then if r is represented by this equation that is equation 5.23, then the power spectral density function of r which is called SRR will be can be written as a t a c u a plus phi t beta s z bar z bar phi beta plus a t a c u z bar phi beta plus phi t beta s z bar u a. So, that uh, uh, follows 
the derivation for the power spectral density function of two quantities or two processes uh, or other weighted processes which you had seen before. If you recall, if y is a response quantity and is a summation of a into x and plus b into z, then the power spectral density function of S of S y or power spectral density matrix of S y y if y is a vector can be written by a rule which we have discussed before and using that rule we have derived this equation for SRR. Now, uh, in order to obtain the mean peak value, we have to in obtain the uh, RMS value or the standard deviation of responses and that uh, we will be uh, discussing in the next class. Thank you.